The threat from terrorism is a persistent and complex as ever before. That is the testimony from the FBI Director Christopher Wray up on Capitol Hill earlier today. This is not a time for panic. It is a time for heightened vigilance. Ray warning his most immediate concern is individuals and small groups who are drawing, quote, twisted inspiration from the events in the Middle East. Separately today, a reminder of just how unruly the southern border remains. We're showing you that video as the state of Texas says they have now arrested a 16-year-old, a teenager, who was smuggling migrants. We'll speak with a top lieutenant from the Lone Star State about how that is possible. Come on in. I'm Blake Berman. This is The Hill on News Nation. All right, here we are, here we go. Joining us today, Ashley Davis, former George W. Bush White House official. Scott Bolden is a News Nation contributor and former D.C. Democratic Party chairman. Brad Howard is a Democratic strategist and former senior aide to House Democrats. And Aaron Perini is a Republican strategist. Hello to you all. Nice to have you in. Hello. Hi. Um, obviously, the big OJ news today. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, President Trump, former President Trump continues to taunt, ask, President Biden to uh, debate him as soon as possible. We'll speak with the Trump campaign momentarily. But first, uh, you are looking live right now at Capitol Hill, where today the head of the FBI, Christopher Wray, testified in the House. And he outlined, the head of the FBI outlined his biggest worry. Our most immediate concern has been that individuals or small groups will draw some kind of twisted inspiration from the events in the Middle East to carry out attacks here at home. All right, so clearly powerful testimony there from the head of the FBI, Ashley. We, we saw an example this week of a teenager, 18 years old, state of Idaho, wanted to shoot up 21 churches, radicalized, or at least inspired by ISIS. I think um, the whole thing is super complicated, and you know I have a lot to say about this, mm. but I think that... Um, the intelligence community is saying that the chatter is higher than it was pre-9-11, one. Two, there's, since the last 14 months, 350 people from the terrorist watch list have come over the border, at least, that we know about. So right. how many don't we know about? Number two. Number three, when he's warning America that something may happen, there's not, and this was one of the big challenges we had after 9-11, is how do you tell the country to be vigilant without t giving them anything where you, you say what it without say? saying it. Correct. And that's why okay. when we came up, everyone made fun of the red, orange, and yellow system. Oh, that's right. I mean, that's right. the duct tape and all right. of that. But right. I mean, it's like, how do you tell people to make sure they're seeing and looking out for things? Because a lot of this right now, and I'm sorry to interrupt you or just to stop you I for was a second. About to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> and you're probably going to tell me something about the border. Um, <laughs> but I do think that the domestic terrorist um, efforts that are happening, which are smaller, small ball, okay. which is not like flying planes into buildings right. is actually a huge concern. If One more thing, if you're in Iowa and blow up a Starbucks, what's that going to do to disrupt it? Uh, On to you. Okay. Well, <laughs> but aren't we always under threat as, as the United States of America? I'm not saying, I'm not, uh, saying belittling this at all. I'm saying I don't think there's anything new here. We are always under threat because who we are, how we distribute foreign aid, and what our positions are on democracy worldwide. And so I don't think there's anything new here. Well, he, he said, said let's be vigilant. He said events inspired by the Middle East, but what I, ongoings yeah. in the Middle East. And I, I love you, but, and, but, you're, if oh, but this is different. No, but the, <laughs> the, 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 if, this is the, different because the, the, the administration okay. is different. The threat is a lot higher. Yeah, and the administration is different. Plans. What did you hear there? I do from, not. What okay. did you hear there from Christopher Wray? Well, I heard one thing that was subtext, which is he is sitting there on Capitol Hill during the funding conversation. Mm -hmm. What he is talking about is the FBI funding, and he's saying, yeah. do not cut a dollar right now. Increase our funding because we need more. But Republicans are going to want increased oversight with those increased dollars, and we have seen a hard push by the Biden administration for not allowing increased oversight, whether it's coming to money to Ukraine or any such deal when it comes to spending taxpayer dollars. But aren't there dollars. some Republicans who are undercutting the idea of the FBI in general? Well, that's because well, of the 
weapon that's a different program. Had but millions it's from, from millions from the FBI. Of government against conservative causes. We've seen the FBI, the DOJ. You can do all sorts of alphabet soup where okay. agencies have targeted conservatives when it's come to pro-life centers, when it has come to parents standing up at school board meetings. Yes, Republicans have felt targeted because there has been examples of weaponization. And so yes, they want increased oversight, and that should be okay with the FBI as well. Brad, one one of the things that we are one of the things that lawmakers are dealing with in Washington right now is this renewal of Section 702 within FISA, which is a post-9-11 thing, essentially being able to warrantless surveillance of foreigners on foreign land. And you would say, oh, why don't you renew that? There's a little bit of an, of an issue right now because there's concerns about what happens when Americans get picked up. And all of this is tied up right now up on Capitol Hill. So that debate and that concern is not new. It has been a part of FISA from the very beginning. We have this debate and this argument, which is why, which is why Congress sunsets it, right, to force the debate every so often to make sure we're utilizing new technologies and new okay. safeguards to protect the privacy of Americans. The Republican problem here in the House at the moment is that Donald Trump came out and said, kill it. And so that's what they hmm. did, but they, they haven't figured out why yet. And so they're trying to figure out a policy <laughs> solution here to address what the president's concerns are. Cool. And I agree there's a lot of privacy activists that have a problem with FISA, but you've got to balance the need to collect actionable intelligence to help us set up but these they did say He did say kill the bill that was, you know, going correct. through that's what I mean. two days ago. Yeah, not but he didn't like the specific. general. Not, not correct, but also, which no one, yeah, yeah. Sorry, no, I to suggest no. no one is talking about this. The FISA court has extended this for one year through April 2025. This is not going to expire this month. Yeah. No one realizes this, and no one's talking about it. Obviously, the House is going to vote on it again tomorrow. They're going to roll... They're going to a committee tonight to bring it to the floor tomorrow. But it does not expire right now. It's already been granted. All right. House Republican leaders, uh, they are trying to pass this key warrantless surveillance program. I mentioned covering non-citizens abroad who are believed to pose a threat to the U.S. The section is it's called 702, uh, which national security officials like the FBI director, we heard from Christopher Wray today, describe it as a crucial tool in keeping the homeland safe. Nineteen Republican lawmakers blocked the legislation from advancing, advancing on Wednesday, including the Republican congressman from Tennessee, Tim Burchett, who joins us live. Congressman Burchett, nice to speak with you. As always, good to have you back here on the Hill. Uh, explain yourself, sir. Why would you vote against this? Well, first of all, what was said earlier is just inaccurate. There was 278,000, over 278,000 violations of this. Now, this is where they've spied on Americans, not on foreigners, and, it, and it's been abused by the FBI, and we know it. They've admitted to it, and there's possibly a, a whole lot more before this. This is when we just brought it to their attention. So, yeah, there's a real problem there. And let me tell you one other problem. I get lobbied two days ago from an official at the State Department, and I don't really even think it's legal for them to be calling me and telling me this. And I said, well, what about the part about Andy Biggs had in there about a representative who had a, um, had a, a part that you had to have search warrants? And what the State Department official told me was, Congressman, that is problematic. Well, your dadgum right, it's problematic. It's supposed to be. And his problem is with the, is, is with the, uh, the Bill of Rights and our Constitution, because you're not supposed to be able to spy on Americans without a search warrant. That ought to scare the hell out of you all in the media, as it does Democrats and Republicans. And you talk like it's, the Republicans brought this thing down. Jerry Nadler voted, voted with us on this to, to take it down. So, and here's what's happening right now as we're speaking. The rules are going back. They're amending it. They're going to allow votes on amendments. That is the way this House is supposed to work. It's not supposed to be the uniparty. It's not supposed to be some backroom okay. thing. And honestly, we ought, to be, we ought to be celebrating what's going on because now we're going to be able to, to amend it to possibly shorten it down to two years. So we will be able to see it. It won't be a five-year situation. Okay. And also the, um, the, uh, the warrant portion will be addressed. Okay. Um, the, I mentioned Christopher Ray, FBI director. Spoke was testifying uh, for hours up on the Hill today. Here's what he said when he was asked about this program. I'll get your reaction on the other side. Sure. But now is not the time for us to hang up our gloves uh, to take away tools that we need to punch back. And failing to reauthorize 702 or gutting it with some kind of warrant requirement would be dangerous and put American lives at risk. 
Is he wrong there, Congressman, as you see it? Well, you know what he's putting America at risk is when, when over 10 million people have come over our border unchecked and we have people on a terrorist watch list that have come over. Where's his concern about that? And also, why do they lobby to have a headquarters for the FBI, honestly, larger than the Pentagon? That's where their funding is, is concerned. They're concerned about the machine, preser political preservation. That's what both parties, that's why this town is, is, is not a swamp, sir. It is an open sewer. And, uh, and I submit to you that, that everything so, just flows in and nothing flows out. This guy, listen, he's part of the problem. We know it. Why isn't he addressing the border and the terrorists that we've caught coming over the border? So he, he, he was obviously up there. I, I hear your displeasure with him, clearly, Congressman. He was up there, um, you know, trying to get as much funding as possible. Should he get the funding that he needs, or do you think there needs to then be a, a closer examination of the FBI? I think there should be closer examination of funding of every department of, the, of this government. Uh, we're $32 trillion in debt. We add a trillion dollars to our debt every hundred days, every hundred days. And nobody's proposing anything other than spend more money. And guess what? The money we're spending now, we're borrowing. We owe the communist Chinese over a trillion dollars as we speak. One day those debts are going to come due and, this, and, and our republic will crumble. Congressman Tim Burchett, got to leave it there, uh, battling some audio issues, uh, playing through it with us. Thank you, Congressman. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll talk to you again I'm sorry. Soon. Thank you, guys. No, no, no. You're, you're, you're all good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you heard you, what brother. there, Aaron? I, yep. I hear the point that I made earlier, which is that Republicans want that oversight. They want accountability across all forms of government. And it has to do with the fact that they want to be stronger stewards of a taxpayer dollar here. You also hear that they are talking about 702 and how they are trying to make changes to it. You wish those negotiations had happened before this got out of Rules Committee, before this got to the floor. But continued negotiations are a good thing. And it means that actually things are working because, as you mentioned, this isn't sunsetting immediately. So they're doing the process. Process. It's ugly to make the sausage in D.C., but this is how it should work. But, but what I hear is the Republicans are willing to kill FISA, the most important intelligence tool we have. They're willing to do that because we're $32 trillion in debt. And this is the problem with the because most conservative. It's actually 35 headed to 36. Yeah, but, 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 but who's, who's counting right. numbers they're, they're in a trillion level? That they're willing to do this. Now, this was a bipartisan bill, as I understand it, and this was a big loss for the Speaker, who doesn't seem to be in control of his uh, of, of his. Uh, of the conference, and what can he get done here? Now, I think the Democrats and the Republicans have a problem with FISA and how it's been implemented. I think that's really clear. But you also cannot handcuff the FBI and threaten their budget when FISA is on the table, and, and it is the most important intelligence tool we have. Has it been abused? Well, you got FISA courts. You can't get a FISA warrant unless a judge signs off Ste on it. So you do have some oversight. Stepping away from FISA for a second, how do you square what you just heard from the congressman to this headline. Um, FBI says 18-year-old ISIS follower plotted flaming sword attacks on local churches. The 18-year-old, who did not yet have his driver's license, planned to use a pipe to create a, quote, flaming sword in a melee-style attack on local churches. So this is, this is where I think... The, it, Look, I actually agree with Aaron here that the regular order is oh critical. And, well, I, I, as a, Don't get the vapors. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, like, regular order is critical to prevent situations like this, like starting with the markup process and the hearing, bringing in diverse opinions and having these battles in committee prevents it from moving to the floor. So I agree. And this is a critical issue. I agree with Aaron too that we've got to drag this out and have this debate because the domestic terrorism angle is where it gets mm -hmm. complicated, right? Mm -hmm. Because if an 18 year old who's a U.S. citizen you think is about to commit a mass atrocity, should you be able to, you know, tap them? And so I think yes. that's a critical you, thing. But I, what I'll just say is, like, for Aaron, the one thing I will disagree with, just to cover myself here, <laughs> is, uh, it's is, about time. Uh, is that, like, the, the Republicans want uh, uh, oversight over the administration now. When Trump was president, they were n they refused to turn over documents to Congress all the time. My position is no part one, of it. Supremacy is that we should try to get as much information as possible. But if their attempts to get it were genuine, I'd be believe it more. You are the uh, first ever employee at the Department of Homeland Security. So I, I White House first, Office of Homeland Security. White House Office of Homeland Security. Yeah. Um, I'll give you the last word here. Well, no, I just want to correct you for a second. I don't think that Republicans don't want to kill FISA, which is a wrong message. They killed it yesterday. They want to, they want to kill the bill that was going in front of the It was a bipartisan floor. bill, they though. Do not, okay, but 
that wasn't it, to your so point. What do they want? It, what do they, they want? want a That's what they're stricter version. <laughs> right. Yes. They're in chaos. Or or even ca- they want a shorter chaos. time frame too. But they don't want to kill the bill, which I think is a yeah. bad yeah. message. Actually, can, okay. Can I ask you a question? If we got to, like a couple seconds, the, the what's the what's the purpose of the terror threat warnings to the public? Is it to cover the administration in case something happens? What can we do as average citizens? Like, how are we supposed to react to this? Nothing. I mean, it goes back to my red, yellow, <laughs> and you know, orange system. <laughs> that you, how do you tell the public to watch out? But I have right. to say, post 9/11. A lot of people, especially in New York before, like two years after the attacks, a lot of citizens came forward and said, this is what's happening. And we we were able to stop a lot of terrorist attacks because of general public. Say something, say something. Exactly. All right, well, coming up here on the Hill, the death of O.J. Simpson, the former NFL player dying, as you might know, at the age of 76 after a battle with cancer from athlete to actor to accused killer in the trial of the century. So how will he be remembered? Way in. Plus, former President Donald Trump now pushing to debate President Biden as soon as possible. It's time for Crooked Joe Biden, the worst president in the history of the United States, and I to debate. All right, a spokesperson for the Trump campaign joins us later in the show. But first, have you seen this video right here? What you are looking at is authorities tracking down accused human smugglers, one of them is 16 years old. One of the lieutenants involved with all of this joins us on the other side of the break. You're watching The Hill here on News Nation. Stay with us. Customs agents spotted a 16 year old smuggling foot guide from Mexico with other illegal immigrants crossing the Rio Grande. That 16-year-old, a minor, was taken into custody in part of Operation Lone Star to crack down on smuggling guides. But that's not the only smuggling across the border. Check out this headline. Within the last four days, one million fentanyl pills found at the border. Spokesperson for the Department, uh, Texas Department of Public Safety is Lieutenant Chris Olivares and joins us live. Lieutenant, thanks for being with us here on The Hill. Appreciate it. A 16-year-old... Uh, involved with smuggling attempts normally. I, I, I guess you just assume this is adults doing this, but I wonder how often you see children uh, doing this. You know, Blake, that's not the, uh, you know, typically that's what we perceive, right? That majority of adults are, you know, involved in some type of human smuggling, but that's not the case. In the last three years, you know, we've seen, you know, more kids. And I say kids because these are young adults. These are you know, 13, 14, 15 year olds that are involved in this type of criminal activity. Uh, these young kids now are taking part in human smuggling. And it's all because the cartels are recruiting these young kids uh, using social media platforms such as TikTok, Snapchat. Uh, and it's all through deceptive advertising because, of course, these kids see this, this glamorous lifestyle that's perceived by the cartels. You know, when they show large stacks of money and jewelry and cars, uh, they only see one yeah. side of it. They really don't see the underlying. Uh, consequences when they get involved with these type of organizations. So, so that, that is, so right that there is there the really how. Shows that, yeah, no, right. sorry to jump in. That, that's the how, right? How they're doing this. But why are they going after children? Well, you know, the cartels realize one thing, and that, that, that video right there, that was part of a 3D operation that we're working with U.S. Border Patrol. In those three days, uh, Blake, we arrested four juveniles that were from Mexico that were smuggling other illegal immigrants across the Rio Grande uh, further into the interior. And what they do is when they bring them across the river, their job is to guide them across the brush and then get them to a load up vehicle by another smuggler who then smuggles them further into the interior. And the reason why the cartels are targeting kids is because there's less consequences when these kids do get caught or arrested. Because for one, some cases, they don't prosecute these kids. And in this particular event, or when we have individuals from Mexico that are here illegally, especially kids, we turn them over to Border Patrol, and all they do is send them back to Mexico, and then they're doing the same type of activity the following day. So this is ongoing cycle, and the cartels are well aware. That's why they exploit that. That's why they exploit using kids to carry out their criminal activity. Lieutenant, level with me here for a second. One million fentanyl pills found at the border in four days. Is, Is that the case? And if so, how? You know, Blake, you know, fentanyl still remains to be a significant threat to our country. You know, our agency alone, DPS, in the last three years, you know, we have seized over 472 million lethal doses statewide in Texas. That's just one agency. 
You know, these are drugs that have made it past, you know, checkpoints, past secondary checkpoints. And these are drugs that would have made it into our, our community. So that still remains to be a significant threat when we talk about fentanyl. It's not it's because the cartels were able to mass produce this drug at a very low cost and get it across the border. And we're continuing seeing these seizures, these massive seizures of pills that are coming across the border. So that still remains a threat to our country when we talk about fentanyl. All right. Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Olivares, thank you for the time. Keep up the great work out there. Uh, appreciate you, sir, uh, and, and hope to talk to you soon. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, back here in Washington, one of the big stories yesterday was this idea of the president might be taking action, executive action on the southern border as it relates to limiting asylum seekers. I don't have much time, but around the table real quick. Do, do you think that's real or do you think that's a trial balloon? I think it's a trial balloon like we saw around the State of the Union. I also, I believe I said this on this program about two weeks ago, I don't think Joe Biden will take any action before the primary is done with him. At this point, he is the Democrat nominee, but he's got too much of a base issue. This is really going to upset his base, and I don't think he's going to do anything. Real or trial balloon? Uh, probably a little both. <laughs> we'll see. But I, I don't think this is, it's not that this is a base problem concern for Joe Biden. I think it's a Hispanic voter problem for Joe Biden. He's concerned that appearing would, would the younger Hispanics or tend to be a little more understanding of what's going on uh, for okay. why people want to cross the board. And I think that it's more of a general election argument. I, th- I, th- I, th- I think it's real. I mean, the Republicans have yelled and screamed that Biden can take executive action and shut the border down or take some action. Now, he's floating this, or if I, I think it's real and stuff. He's got to do something about the border. <laughs> we agree on that. Yeah. You wh- just can't have those images the way they are and what's, what you're finding at the border. The White oh. House, they w- was asked about this. Queen Jean-Pierre basically gave a, gave a no comment. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I hope it's real because he does mm-hmm. have the power mm-hmm. to do it, which is what Republicans have been saying for the last three and a half years. All right. Okay. Still much more ahead here on the Hill of the, uh, the Hill. <coughs> Excuse me. The death of O.J. Simpson, how the white Bronco chase changed the media forever, and what the White House, speaking of, is now saying about O.J.'s passing. Plus, presidents normally don't debate until September and October. The cable and TV networks are now trying to make sure that actually happens. President Biden hasn't committed. Donald Trump wants it sooner than that. But why? We will ask the Trump campaign on the other side of the break. You are watching us here on The Hill. Stay with us. Today, O.J. Simpson passed away at the age of 76 from cancer. From all-pro football player to famous pitchman to actor and sports broadcaster, Simpson was one of the most recognized faces in all of North America. But... Of course, it was the brutal murder of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and Ron Goldman. A police chase throughout L.A. and eventually a trial where he was ultimately acquitted that catapulted him to become one of the most infamous men on the planet. All right, Scott. Um, when you th- this, We got the news today, and, and you thought what? It really was a trial of the century. Mm-hmm. It's changed everything, how we look at domestic violence, uh, how we look at athletes, and even um, CTA or CTC uh, impact. Um, Lawyers, cameras in the courtroom, uh, victims, right, being blamed and not blamed. And remember, O.J. may have beaten the criminal case, but there was a civil case where the standard is preponderance of the evidence, Mm -hmm. and he was convicted by the plaintiffs who were the victims or the children. uh, Their children were, were killed. But here's the deal. On the criminal case, remember this. It took a year to try this case. The jury came back in four hours. Mm -hmm. It is literally impossible to go through every piece of evidence after a year, all the testimony, and do that in four hours. This was an emotional verdict. It was a, and and notwithstanding the impact on race relations, not just in LA, but how black folks and others viewed this verdict, Mm. the criminal justice system, whether it was fair or not, whether it was racist or not, they introduced racism into the courtroom, the judge did, and then the career paths of so many people involved in this case uh, all changed because of OJ, and not always for the better. Okay. I will say this one thing, that um, this should be a warning to, to every man across the country. If you get tested for prostate cancer and they catch it early, mm. it is a very yeah. easy to Especially beat form people. of cancer. So if there's anything we can take out of today that should be something to give hope for this, not only for Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown's families, who I'm sure are reeling with grief and everything, but if you are a man, you should get your prostate, you should get this check, and if you catch it early, it's very survivable. But I'll also add, as somebody who was about 10 years old when this whole trial happened, that... 
It, uh, the, <laughs> no, the, 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 um, the, the OJ Chase, the Bronco Chase was on my birthday. I remember yeah. watching, sitting there on my birthday, what the year? NBA Finals with the Rockets yes. game. What year? Not your birthday year, but what year this was, was it? This uh, was 94, 95. 94. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was about 10 or 11. But to your point, there was a lot of ramifications legally, but pop culturally, this mm-hmm. just has, this has stuck. I mean, anybody in D.C. knows one of the best 90s cover yes. bands here is White Ford Bronco. Okay. And, like, it's named after this. It's just become a pop culture phenomenon, the trial, the drama around it, and all the reenactments that have happened on us. Uh, Does that mean I'm too old? <laughs> <laughs> 90s cover bands is my favorite. All right. uh, meantime, coverage of O.J.'s death continues tonight here on News Nation on Cuomo. Guest host Geraldo Rivera reflects on the O.J. Simpson trial only on News Nation. Geraldo. 8 o'clock here on News Nation, just uh, about an hour and a half from now. Meantime, for over 60 years, televised presidential debates have been a staple of American politics. Former President Trump is demanding that happen again, this time around with President Biden. It's time for Crooked Joe Biden, the worst president in the history of the United States, and I to debate. We have to talk about what he's doing and where we're going. We owe it to our country. We owe it to all Americans. Anytime, anywhere, any place. The president, though, has not publicly committed to debating Trump, instead saying, quote, it depends on his behavior. Now, News Nation has signed on to a draft letter with other major networks calling for debates to happen through the Bipartisan Commission on Presidential Debate. That letter reads, in part, quote, If there is one thing Americans can agree on during this polarized time, it is that the stakes of this election are exceptionally high. Amidst that backdrop, there is simply no substitute for the candidates debating with each other. Joining us now is the Trump campaign national press secretary, Caroline Levitt. Caroline, thanks for being back here with us on the Hill. Nice to see you as always. Appreciate the time. So the president has, a former president, has made this sort of a a talking point, a sticking point here in the recent days and weeks. Why? Well, you heard it from President Trump himself. He is ready to debate Joe Biden anytime, anywhere, any place, because the American people deserve to hear that debate. They deserve to hear the contrast between Joe Biden's disastrous record and President Trump's vision to make this country great again. And our campaign sent a letter to the Presidential Debate Commission today expressing that we would like to see these debates as soon as possible. We're in an unprecedented, unique election between a former president and an Incumbent president, President Trump's dominance in the Republican primary wrapped up the, the nomination very quickly. And so let's get rolling with these debates. By the time the schedule, okay, so- as the Presidential uh, Debates Commission has scheduled it now, it, the last debate is in October. And by then, nearly 8 million Americans will have already cast their ballot. We want to debate now. Right, so- Why won't Joe Biden do it? Probably because he doesn't want to take responsibility for his horrible policies. I I hear you uh, that you wanted ASAP, but here's the schedule. The first one scheduled for mid-September in Texas. Uh, The second one, October 1 in Virginia. The third one, a week later in the state of Utah. If that's how this ends up playing out, Caroline, that, that, that these are the three, does the former president sign on to showing up to those three? You heard it from President Trump himself. He will debate anytime, anywhere, any place with any moderator. Absolutely. It is Joe Biden who has to answer the question of why he won't make that same commitment to the American people. Is it because he does not want to talk about or take responsibility for his wide open border? Is it because he does not actually have a plan to curb inflation? Or is it because his handlers know that he is far too weak to stand on a stage for two hours with President Trump, who is tenacious and tough? The American people deserve this debate, and we want to see it happen as soon as possible. Does Trump Trump care about the moderators? I mean, he has slammed the Presidential Debate Commission in the past. Uh, So if the moderators are, say, you know, New York Times, MSNBC, CNN, does he do it? He has said that. He has said, and he delivers on his promises. He'll debate anytime, anywhere, (laughs) any place, any moderator to make it even easier for Joe Biden. All right. I think we get the point. Caroline Levitt, uh, press secretary for the uh, Trump campaign. Nice to see you, Caroline. Thank you. Thanks, Blake. <sighs> yep. Um, please. He wants it. Ne- please what? Please come to me. <laughs> please what? Go. Please come to me. Go, go, go. Please come to me. Go. I want to sort through the hypocrisy with my panel. Now, 
Donald Trump won't debate candidates within his own party. Joe Biden didn't either. He didn't have an opponent. No real opponents, if you uh, that's unfair. Let me get to my point. Go for it. He hates the nonpartisan presidential commission. He, he walked away from one, ba- one debate in 2020. The RNC withdrew from the presidential commission. They may not even be qualified to get on the stand with Joe Biden. And then, does Donald Trump not believe his numbers? In the, in the tough states, in the campaign, he's either beating Biden or tied with Biden in the swing states, and he's ahead in some polls and right behind Biden in other polls. Why is he begging Joe Biden to debate? That usually comes with, from someone who believes they're going to lose their race, not someone who's winning the race. You, you think that's what it is? No, I, I don't think, know. I, I think it's because, listen, if there's one thing that Donald Trump has shown, and I think he really highlighted in the 2016 debates, so he's very quick on his feet in these debates. Everybody remembers that line to Hillary Clinton, well, you would be in jail, right? It's <laughs> Sticks in your mind You're like bragging that. Or complaining no, about I'm that. Ta- no, That's I, an awful uh, line. No, I am telling you, he is quick on his feet. And that makes him a good debater. But I will say, I think the best point that the Trump team makes is about the voting timeline. That when it comes to the fact that these debates mainly happen after voting has already started, if the American people need to see an exchange of ideas and a conversation between a former president and a sitting president in order to make their decision, the timeline should be moved up so that it's before... And and by the way, we should point out that President Biden has not yet committed to this. That's true. Why not? To the ones later. To the ones later, yeah, yeah. 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 Because, first of all, let me say, if only there were a commission that could resolve all these different things. (laughs) Uh, That's not partisan. uh, And there is. And so, really, the president should be lobbying the commission for these changes. And part of what I think the White House is saying is that it's not just about if you do debates. It is about what type of debates and what accountability does the moderate and the host have to allow both candidates to espouse what they believe and to criticize each other and to actually listen to each other. Well, if only Donald there was Trump, a bipartisan the commission that could handle all of that. The problem with Donald Trump's debate performances is that he tends to just talk over people and, and, the, and it okay. does a disservice to viewers who want to hear both sides equally. Joe Biden gotta, won the debates in 2020. He will debate the president. I, I got to run, but I, I want to sneak all Ashley right. in. Yes. Oh, no, I just was having flashbacks of him not to deba- I mean what you said too okay. and maybe it's just a little bit of right. they had to <laughs> cut by, by, the, by the way they had to cut the mic on Donald out, Trump he, you get to debate you he don't get to debate and, and that's what we got to protect by the way exactly. Donald Trump Donald Trump didn't show up in the Republican primary debates, didn't show up in the News Nation primary debate uh, in December in Alabama. If you're watching us at home or listening to us on Sirius XM <laughs> and said, Blake, we would have loved to have heard from the Biden campaign. <laughs> <laughs> we asked uh, the Biden campaign to come on tonight to respond, to, to get their take and, and their thought. Um, they did not. And we've asked them for a statement as well. If they get back to us, we will pass it along. Coming up, he is the biggest star in baseball and one of the biggest star athletes in all the world. And now the Justice Department is explaining how the translator for Shohei Otani allegedly ripped him for millions. And remember this from earlier in the week? So if they don't do a better job of self-regulation, you'll see more pressure for government to step in. That was the co-chair of the Gaming Caucus in Congress just a few days ago here on the Hill. So is Congress going to jump in? We got a follow-up from her, and we'll talk about it next. You're watching the Hill here on News Nation. Now, I spoke to Congresswoman Dina Titus about this topic earlier this week. She is the co-chair of the Congressional Gaming Caucus. We sent a letter earlier uh, in the year to all the leagues and their support groups to say you need to be sure that your rules about betting internally as well as externally are very clear, that they are communicated to your players as well as to your staff. If they don't do a better job of self-regulation, you'll see more pressure for government to step in. Now, the congresswoman gave us an additional statement today saying, quote, we must continue cracking down on illegal operators who harm consumers while supporting leagues in their efforts to educate players and protect athletic integrity. She also went on to say, paraphrasing, uh, that essentially glad that Otani had nothing to do with this Mm -hmm. on on his end, seemingly. Are we going to see Congress jump in here at all? Uh, you know, I, it's, it's a lot of I, money at I, stake. A lot I, I love of money. Congresswoman Dina Titus because I think she's got the best accent in Congress, and I'm a big fan of Southern <laughs> accents. But number two, you know, she's she's the Las Vegas Congresswoman. 
cracking down on legal gaming. You do gaming the right way, you go to Vegas. This is basically, no, but I'm saying, I do think it is a protection of the industry as a whole. If it starts getting out of control and starts really hurting Americans, that is a damage to the gaming industry, which is a multi-million dollar industry here in the U.S. It's a job creator in Nevada, particularly among Hispanics. Everywhere, actually, in the country where mm-hmm. gambling is illegal. I think that if the Congress gets involved, if the U.S. attorney finds some evidence, mm-hmm. hmm. he says there's none against Otani right now because $16 million is a lot of money to yeah. spend. And, and whether you have a language barrier or not, I'm going to know whether I got $16 million gone or I not. I mean, that's wild. He didn't, right. he didn't did, know that $16 they, million is If they find something, or even if they don't charge him but find something right. of his participation, I think okay. Congress will get involved. All right. So uh, is he worried about the polling or is his argument legitimate? Mark Cuban telling Business Insider that he wished people understood, quote, how little impact any president has, end quote, on the economy, adding that it's, quote, the 330 million of us that move the economy, not one person. (laughs) Now, it comes as a recent poll showed 73 percent of Americans named the economy as the top policy priority for the 2024 election. Polling, as you might know, also routinely shows that Americans trust Donald Trump over President Biden to handle the economy. So does he have a point here? That it's not the president who moves this, or is it like, I, I'm pro-Biden, I, I need to make, make that point. Well, I also think that another part of that, what he said, was people shouldn't worry about the economy as much when they're going to the polls, which right. is actually a problem when <laughs> he's probably right. not going to the grocery store. Um, but I, he owns well, the grocery store. He's not buying it. Somebody right. to the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> that matters. Yeah. But um, it, the bottom line is it's always been hung around the president's neck, and it's right. going to continue and to be. It, I, think, I think it's a tough situation to hear Mark Cuban tell anybody <laughs> when it comes to the economy. Right. I just think that reads... I think it just reads very tone deaf on his part. If the American people are telling you, man, it's really hard to buy groceries, man, gas is expensive, man, the economy matters to me. Yes, it does get hung around the president's neck. Telling them, like, shush, shush, plebeians, that's not the issue here. That, that, it just but, doesn't read well. What I will say, one role the president does have with the economy is can be the cheerleader for the American people. Mm-hmm. Can or, you know, convince, not maybe convince is the wrong word, but help them, um, you know, bring pride into America. And, hold, hold, hold that thought, because let me show you U.S. economic confidence. Show the chart if we have it. Yeah. How do you square with what you're saying with that? Uh, well, the, the, again, the, this is what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's a concern because what the president can do is message, right? That's, they can build confidence, and Biden's got he's to improve how he's but talking he's, about the economy. Um, you know, but it, it is a reminder of, I used to work for a member of Congress who said, when gas prices go up, I get 10,000 letters complaining. When gas prices go down, I don't get a single thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's par for course, though. It, whoever the president is is going to get blamed, if you will. <laughs> Biden's been messaging. The problem is there's a gap in his messaging and what people are feeling around mm-hmm. the, the table and at the gas store, at the uh, gas stations. He's been he's, messaging binomics, which, as Republicans, Republicans were really but, happy about yeah, it. Yeah, put your name right on that. Are good, but it's interesting. You just added 300,000 yeah. jobs to the economy. I say, Donald Trump, his economic message is one of doom and, and, and dismay, and it's resonating with voters. So I think that should tell you a little bit about what Don't fix it until I get to be president. <laughs> well, <laughs> so you oh. just said it's, it's par for the course. You know what you did? You just teed me up. <laughs> I did. You ready for the you third one of that? Uh, Go for it. There just might be one place in the country that is inflation-proof, at least for the <laughs> week. But Today uh, is uh. the first round of the Masters. <laughs> and have you seen the Masters concession menu? Despite huge increases in most food prices across the country in recent years, you can always count on Augusta National <laughs> and the menu there to essentially stay dead flat. It's been that way for decades now. Here's a look. Uh, at the menu, if you're lucky enough to get inside the gates there uh, in Augusta, egg salad a buck fifty, pimento cheese a buck fifty, drinks two dollars. They raised the beer though this year to six bucks a beer. But like, if you go to, I mean, this is the Super Bowl of That's golf. You go to the Super Bowl. Price. You went to the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah. How much $20. was a beer at the I'm Super Bowl? I'm ashamed of how much I spent. <laughs> <laughs> how, much you, how much did you spend at the Super Bowl uh, on food? On Hundreds? food? Oh yeah, I'm over that. Okay. Yeah, and so 100. there you got the Masters. It's like. <laughs> A place for them, stuck in time. For them, it's not about the money, though, right? right. Like, they, 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 they make right. all their money on the tickets. Uh, by the way, right. this, is exactly. better, this is better PR than they could ever. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. But I was going to exactly. say, you know, all the people who are hurting in this economy, thankfully, the wealthy and uh, <laughs> powerful are, have inflation-proof food. So, well, well, you <laughs> know, the tickets, Blake, though. Wait a minute, Blake. <laughs> I want you to get everybody on the give Joe Biden credit for keeping <laughs> food prices down at the Masters now. I'm going to insist on that. And I want to hear you say it's exactly what Donald Trump did, too, during his four years. Yes, oh, that doesn't count. That, that was a different time. Okay, that was a- <laughs>
by the way, uh, you know, Augusta National is is the elite of the elite and as elite as it gets. But I was looking at ticket prices, which are obviously like, you know, trillions on the secondary market. I think it's only like 115 bucks face value. Yeah, to get it. But if you order order the master's food to your house, you get three little containers, like 10 bags of chips or whatever. It's 175 bucks. Hmm. So you want stuff shipped out of Augusta. It's not that bad. (laughs) Coming up, the building uh, right here. Was once north of two million, two hundred million dollars, rather. It's also uh, was just sold in Leland Vitter's hometown on a ninety-eight percent discount, two cents on the dollar. How did that happen, and why? It actually makes a lot of sense. Leland joins us on the other side of the break. You're watching the Hill. News Nation tonight, special primetime coverage. It's one of the most infamous murder trials ever, and Geraldo Rivera was there for it all. Now he's guest hosting Cuomo, remembering the murder, the chase, and the trial of O.J. Simpson. And on Dan Abrams Live, hear O.J. in his own words talk about the murders. Then, Cato Kalin, O.J.'s former house guest, is only talking to Ashley live. Special coverage starts tonight, 8, 7 central, only on News Nation. Play and Alexa. Children are the greatest joy and our best hope for a better future. Friends, they are the future. But did you know that millions of kids are facing hunger every day? Food is not just food, it's energy, health, confidence, hope, and even love. Yes, love. Thank you! Learn more about how No Kid Hungry is helping end child hunger in America at HelpNoKidHungry.org. Something big is cooking during Spring Black Friday at the Home Depot with the Weber Jumbo Joe Premium Charcoal Grill. We're talking almost two feet across big. That's 13 burgers at once big. Right now, get the Weber Jumbo Joe Premium Charcoal Grill for just $99.98 and bring that classic charcoal experience to your cookout. Buy it online and pick it up in-store to get to grilling sooner. Go big during Spring Black Friday with the Weber Jumbo Joe Premium Charcoal Grill, now just $99.98 at the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Order select in-stock items by 4 p.m. subject to availability. Today alone, 5,370 people in the United States will be diagnosed with cancer. That's why Stand Up to Cancer funds and develops the newest and most promising cancer treatments. Stand Up to Cancer wants to provide you with every opportunity to join in this mission. By donating your home, land, or commercial property, you can help Stand Up to Cancer fund innovative cancer research. Stand Up to Cancer makes the process easy, and it may be tax-deductible. Visit StandUpToCancer.org slash GivePropertyTo to learn more. You're listening to News Nation, America's fastest growing cable news network, covering a full range of perspectives from across the country. Thanks for calling Discover. This is Gabby. Hey, Gabby. It's Jennifer Coolidge. Hi. I'm, I'm so glad I reached you at 2 a.m. Oh, of course. Anyone with a Discover card can call and talk to a real person 24 7. Now, how can I help? Yeah, I used my Discover card to buy these yellow pleather pajamas, and I'm just not sure I'm pulling them off. 24-7 U.S.-based customer service. It pays to discover. Limitations apply. Learn more at discover.com slash credit card. Are you prepared for an emergency or disaster? Because it's not a matter of if, but when. Don't find yourself saying, <laughs> when the storm rolls in, my time to find a pet-friendly evacuation center will have run out. The scorching heat wave will leave me powerless to cool my insulin. I'll face a hurricane without meds. Now that's a tough pill to swallow. Let's prepare so we all have a better story to tell. Get started at ready.gov slash older adults. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. There's nearly 678,290,000 kids under five around the world. But what's so important about being five? Well, children who live to age five are twice as likely to reach adulthood. That's why vaccines matter so much. For 40 years, Rotary and Partners have delivered vaccines globally. Like here... And even here, in your neighborhood and around the world, Rotary is ensuring children grow up safe from preventable diseases. You can't escape a traffic jam. Know what else you can't escape? Seasonal allergies. And you might think you can avoid that coffee stain until... Oh, really? You can't escape a lot of things in life. But you can escape prediabetes. Prediabetes captures one in three adults. 
there are usually no signs of prediabetes. In fact, most people don't even know they have it. But with early diagnosis, you can change the outcome and prevent or delay type 2 diabetes. Take action by taking the one-minute risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. You might not be able to escape having this song stuck in your head. But you can escape prediabetes. Go to doihaveprediabetes.org today. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. From town of St. Louis, one of the city's tallest office buildings sold for a bargain, or was it, uh, this week. The AT&T Tower went for $3.6 million. In 2006, it sold for over $200 million. That drop in price is a sign of uh, cities, we're seeing it all over the country, that are struggling to keep up with the change in working habits since the pandemic. 